right. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. This is definitely one of our favorite months of the school year. Every February, we kick all the men out for the month, and we host Women in Science and Exploration. We've been talking to scientists, conservationists, explorers, engineers, uh, and the month has barely just begun. We still have a whole lot of events uh, coming up for you to tune into. Tomorrow for classrooms, we start a three-day festival um, called the Women Blaze Trails Festival. We have 50 plus speakers over three days uh, sharing their stories um, with the general public. And there'll be 15 events during the school day, 15, 25 minute events that you can tune into uh, with your classrooms throughout the day. So we hope some of you are able to join us. All uh, right, we are taking a trip to one of our favorite places, uh, to visit. Uh, we've been doing events with the Duke Lemur Center uh, ever since the school year started and they just keep getting more and more fun. This time we are going to meet uh, Lydia Green. Lydia's joined us in the past. She is a research scientist at the Duke Lemur Center. For those who don't know about the center, it was founded in 1966 on the campus of Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. It is a world leader in the study, care, and protection of lemurs, which are the Earth's most threatened group of mammals. So they have uh, more than 200 animals uh, representing 14 different species. They have an incredible, one of the premier fossil collections uh, on the planet. We get to visit behind the scenes there from time to time. But today we're gonna dive into a little lemur science action with Lydia. So let's bring Lydia nice front and center for us. Hi Lydia, how are you doing today? Hi, how's it going? Good, good, it's great to see you. Great good to, to have see you as well. Here. Yeah. And we're excited to let you take over and take us into the world of lemur science. All right, so can you see my screen? I just brought it into the call, yep. Okay, so I'm gonna pop this up. All right, so today I'm gonna do something a little different than I normally would do for a talk because normally I would just go ahead and talk about some aspect of lemur science that I study, like the gut microbiome or behavior or hibernation. But today, given that it's like International Women and Girls in Science Day, I thought I would instead talk a little bit about what it's like to actually be a lemur scientist. And so I often get asked a suite of questions that I'm gonna attempt to answer today about what it's like to be a scientist, including things like, what is it that scientists actually do? Um, so what does my life look like on a day-to-day -day basis? What are my tasks involved in my job? What do I love about my job? And what do I maybe not love so much about my job? Um, and then what path did I take to get here. So I'm going to try to get through all of those questions today, and I'm going to try to do it pretty quickly so that we have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. All right, so the first thing I want to dive into is this big question of what does one actually do as a scientist and as a lemur scientist in particular? What kinds of jobs do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? And it turns out that scientists do a lot of things. So at our core, we are asking questions about the world around us, and then we are designing studies to gather evidence to answer those questions. But in order to be able to answer those questions, we have to be kind of a jack of all trades and be able to do a lot of different things. And generally, science projects follow a pretty consistent flow. So the first thing we have to do is plan a project. And so this is the time that we're coming up with a question we want to answer. We're thinking about how we're going to collect evidence to answer that question. We're brainstorming with our colleagues, with our peers, with our mentors, with our students. We're designing the study, figuring out how many lemurs do we want to watch? What types of data do we need? Are we going to study them in the rainy season or the dry season? So all those sort of methodological questions. We get to hammer out really, really early and how we're going to do this. And then once we know what question we want to ask and how we're going to answer it, the next thing we have to do is find support for our project. And so we usually have to write big proposals that we submit to the government or to a philanthropic organization, and we ask them to support our research and provide the funding to be able to do the project. So planning a project even before we go hang out in the woods with the lemurs is a really important part of a scientist's job. And then once you know what you're gonna do and how you wanna do it, you have to go do it. And so this is the part of science that I think most people are familiar with. It's this idea of project implementation. This is when you see us collecting data. We might be in the forest watching lemurs or collecting fecal samples. We might be in the lab pipetting liquids into other tubes, um, extracting DNA from samples or measuring hormones, all that kind of work. This is just the middle phase of science projects. 
And then of course, once we collect all that evidence, we have to do the analyses to figure out what the results are and how we're gonna be able to answer that original question we posed so long ago. And so once we're done doing the physical work of the project and we have our results and we have the answer to our question, then we have to share our results with other scientists in our community. And so this is called dissemination, which is a fancy word. But basically what we're doing is we're writing up reports, we're writing up um, papers, we call them, of the work that we did, why we did it, how we did it, and what we found. And then we're publishing those papers in journal articles and scientific journals. We might also give presentations to share our results while speaking, but we have to tell other scientists what we did and why it matters. And so this sounds like a lot of work, um, and it is, but the reality is that usually scientists have a dozen or so projects running at the same time. And this is because any single project from planning all the way through to publishing can take anywhere from a year to even five or 10 years to finish. So this is a really, really long process. And so we tend to run multiple projects at the same time that are in various different phases of completion. So today I might be thinking up a new project with my colleagues. At the same time, I might be collecting data for a project that's already ongoing. And at the same time, I might actually be writing up the results of a finished project um, to try to publish those results in a journal. So we're sort of constantly doing a variety of different tasks and juggling our schedules and juggling multiple different projects at the same time. Um, and if this sounds like it's a lot of work, um, it is, but we actually do more than just this because scientists provide service to society beyond just running our own science projects. And so, for example, a lot of us practice what we call science communication. And so we don't just talk about our work to other scientists. We actually talk about our work with members of the general public. And so this can take the form of posting on social media, which is one of my favorite ways to communicate science. It can also mean talking directly to the media through radio or television. It can mean giving public talks like the one I'm doing today. It could also be writing up blogs um, for a variety of different online sources, just anything that gets our information out to the general public. And then we also practice something called science education, um, which is um, where we provide um, education in the types of work that we do um, and in the, the methods that we use and in the background sort of like different fields of research that we work in. So for scientists that work at universities and their faculty and professors, um, they usually teach classes like introduction to biology or zoology or primatology. Um, so they would teach classes to undergraduate students, but we also work a lot one-on-one -on -one with mentors mentoring students. And so, for example, I'll be mentored by my supervisor, but I'll also mentor students um, on projects. So there's a lot of mentoring that goes on. And so this is a lot to take in, but what I'm trying to get at is this idea that scientists do a lot of work. Um, and it's a really, really dynamic space to be in professionally because everything's always different and always changing. And we just get to work on a real diversity of tasks on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's really fun. All right, so how is it that we actually juggle this workload, this diverse workload? What does a day in the life of a scientist look like? And the great thing is that there is no such thing as a typical day in my life. And every day in my life looks different than the day before and looks different than the day after, which is really super fun. Um, but if I were to have sort of a typical day of, let's say, data collection, so in that middle phase of implementing a project, and let's say I'm going to spend all day out in the woods here at the Lemur Center collecting data on what our animals are doing while they're going about their lives, um, a normal day would look something like this. I would wake up absurdly early at around 4.45 in the morning and drink as much coffee as I could very quickly. And then by 6 a.m., I'm out with the lemurs in the woods um, right around sunrise, and I'm starting to collect data on what they're doing and where they're going. Usually for me, this will be just writing it down in a notebook every time I see them eat something. And I'll stay with them all morning. And then I'll take a really nice long lunch break, get off my feet, um, drink a lot of water, and I'll also spend part of my lunch answering any emails that I need to. So I'm keeping on top of other projects and staying in connection um, with my colleagues, um, make sure I'm not losing anything um, in the day. And then I'll go back out for the afternoon and I'll do another big long afternoon observational session where I'll continue collecting data on what our lemurs are doing all afternoon. And mostly in the afternoon they're napping, but um, it's still important that I hang out with them and collect those sorts of data. 
And then the lemurs will go to bed at sunset and that's when I'll leave them. And then I'll sort of run home as fast as I can, shovel dinner down, answer any really critical emails that can't wait until tomorrow um, and then crash into bed. So I love these days of data collection because I actually spend very little time on my computer and it's very rewarding just to be outside and be with the animals and just be watching them and learning from them. So these days are really great. On the flip side would be a day in my life when I'm doing no such data collection and I'm really working on writing or data analyses and really having more of a traditional like desk job. And even when I'm at my desk for most of the day, what's really nice about being a scientist is that I often get to set my own schedule. So I don't work a nine to five job. I really get to decide when I'm most productive and when I want to work, um, which is one of the things I love about my work is that flexibility. So a typical day at the desk would be waking up at around 6.30 or 7 for me. And then I tend to do almost all of my science communication um, via social media posting really early in the morning. So I try most days to get a nice lemur photograph on Instagram with some science information to go with so that everybody um, can see a really nice picture to start their day during their commute or over breakfast or something like that. And I hope that provides some inspiration um, um, for my followers on social media. And then for me, I set aside almost the entire morning for writing. Um, I do my best writing early in the morning. That's when my brain is most active and I'm really good at constructing sentences, I guess. Um, so this writing time could be for writing um, articles, hopefully for publication. It could be writing grants to get funding for new projects. It could be writing blogs for social media. It could be writing emails. It doesn't matter for me. If you see me in the morning while I'm at my desk, I'm probably writing. I will take a lot of breaks because I can't just sit and write for four hours straight. Um, so I take a lot of breaks to go see some of our lemurs usually, um, and also to help collect data on other projects where I might not be the lead on that project, but I am a collaborator. So Marina Blanco, another one of our research scientists at the Lemur Center, um, she runs our hibernation project on the dwarf lemurs. And so sometimes I'll get to take a break, um, go help her collect a little bit of data on say how our juveniles are growing. And then the afternoon for me is really my non-writing time. I'm a terrible writer in the afternoon. I just can't put sentences together. So this for me would be the time that I would dedicate to things like data analyses or making figures, graphs of my data. This would also be when I would try to schedule all of my lab work. So if I needed to extract DNA from fecal samples, I'd try to do that in the afternoon. And then by 5 p.m., I really try to turn into a couch potato and put work away and just enjoy family time and enjoy not working. And this is a this is a goal for me to always put work away um, when I'm not in the field by 5 p.m. All right. So that's kind of a day to day life. So another question that I often get asked is, what do I love about my job? And I kind of answered this a little bit already, which is I love the flexibility of my schedule. Um, and I love that I get to work on a diversity of tasks. But of course, a huge perk of being a lemur scientist is the lemurs themselves. Um, I've been studying these lemurs for 14 plus years, and I never get tired of watching them go about their day. I am I continue to be inspired and fascinated by them. And I just think that they will be a source of curiosity and inspiration for me for the rest of my life. And I'm very grateful that I get to work with them and that I get to wake up every day um, and think about these guys. So that's the really important part for me about my job. But there's other things I love as well. I love that my job allows me to travel. Um, and so a lot of the traveling is of course in Madagascar, which is where lemurs live in the wild. But being a scientist also means you get to travel for other reasons. And often we get to travel to present our studies at conferences. So this is where a bunch of scientists who all study the same thing from all over the world will get together. And we have sort of three days to a week to share all of our science with each other through presentations and, and coffee community, like um, chats and things like that. So right before the pandemic hit, I got to go to San Francisco. This is me presenting alongside my sister, who's also a scientist together. Um, and during this pandemic year, I was actually slated to go both to Ecuador and the Netherlands to present. So you can really get um, a nice travel experience both domestically and internationally by being a scientist. And one of the things that I really love about being a scientist is that a lot of our work is rooted in teamwork. And so that would be in the field, in the lab, while you're writing at the Lemur Center. 
I really love um, the space that I get to be in when diverse perspectives come together to answer a question that we're all interested in from different ways of thinking. And it's a really, really nice synergistic place to be professionally. And it's really nice to be able to celebrate successes together as a group. And also when things don't go well, to be able to share um, in those failures and in those learning experiences and not feel like the burden of that is totally on you. So I really appreciate this sort of team mentality that you get to work in in science. All right, so what do I like less about being a scientist? And I should caution this with saying that I love my job. I love being a scientist. I love being a lemur scientist. But with every job, there come things that are like less of your favorite things about it. So these are sort of the things that constantly are in the back of my mind. And the first one is something I kind of alluded to already, but it's this idea of putting work away at the end of the day. Um, and so there's something called work-life balance where you're making sure that work doesn't take over your entire life. Um, and because I'm so passionate about my work and I love what I do, I have a tendency to have a really hard time just turning that work brain off and just really not thinking about work at the end of the day or over the weekend or on vacation. So for me, work-life balance is really more of like a goal than something I've actively achieved. And then I think for anyone who works um, in the climate or environment or with endangered species, I think the conservation and climate crises are never far away from our brains when we're working. So there is sort of an emotional toll of working um, with animals that very well could go extinct in my lifetime or in the lifetime of the couple of generations behind me. So that's never really far from my brain when I'm working with, with lemurs. And then related to both of these, it's just the idea that there's not enough time to do everything that I wanna do, um, be that in a day, a week, a month, a year, or my life. Um, there are way more questions out there that I have that I have time to answer. And so I know I know going into this that I'm never gonna be able to solve every everything that I wanna solve and that um, there will always be that puzzle out there about lemurs that I haven't quite solved yet. So that sometimes is kind of frustrating. All right, so with that said, let's say one wanted to become a scientist to grow up, um, get a job as a scientist, be that in lemurs or in some other system, what does that path look like? And I should say that many scientists, when they're kids, they have no idea that they want to be a scientist. I didn't know that I wanted to be a scientist until I was in my 20s already. Um, so it's you don't have to know already when you're really young that this is something that you wanna do. But normally what would happen is you would go to primary and secondary school, like most kids, and then you'd go to college and presumably you'd major in something related to science like biology or physics or even engineering. Um, and then you'd go to graduate school where you'd get your master's degree, but most likely your PhD degree. So you'd get a doctorate in philosophy and some related topic, some kind of science. Um, and then you'd become what's called a postdoctoral fellow. So postdoc meaning after you have your doctorate degree. And this would be a time when you're sort of becoming really independent as a scientist, but you're still working with like a faculty mentor in a lab. So you still have some supervision, but you're learning really how to be your own scientist. And then after being a postdoc, you'd get a job as a professional scientist, um, be that faculty at a university or working with a government science agency or working in industry. So there's a lot of different ways and jobs that you can have as a professional scientist. But the spoiler alert is that most scientists do not follow this path straight through. And most scientists take their own path at their own pace. And like I said, they don't have to know at any single one of these steps um, that what they wanna be when they grow up. And you can really take as many twists and turns as you like and explore the things in life that are of interest to you and still end up being a scientist. So for me, this was kind of what my path looked like. And I had three sort of big deviations, I guess, changes from the tip, the traditional path of all the steps you would need to become a scientist. Um, and so, like I said, when I was a kid, I had no idea that I wanted to be a scientist. And I actually tried to become a professional ballet dancer. So I trained seriously in high school and then um, joined a company, a ballet company for a year um, after I graduated high school. So this was me as a ballet dancer many moons ago. And like I said, at this point, I had no idea I'd be a scientist. I thought I'd be a dancer um, until I retired from the ballet world. And so I'm often asked if I could go back and do it all over again, would I skip the step and just go straight into science? And the answer is absolutely not. I would totally go down this route again because every um, life experience like this that you have is an opportunity to gain skills that are really gonna help you in whatever career you choose, but especially in science. And so I often credit my time in ballet with 
with teaching me things like being self-motivated, having strong discipline and having a strong um, independent streak. Um, and so I can really trace a lot of the things about myself as a scientist that I use back to my ballet training. And then after I stopped being a ballet dancer because I decided it wasn't for me, I moved back home with my folks for a year um, before figuring out what it is that I wanted to do next. And I took a year and I worked at Starbucks um, making coffee, um, which actually was a really great experience. And I really learned a lot from this year in my life. Um, and again, there's a lot of skills that I learned in customer service that have really helped me as a scientist. So things like managing my time. And by the time I left the company, I was a supervisor. So also being able to manage um, my team effectively. And I also learned things like how to talk to customers, how to, how to talk to my team, and also things like resilience because I was working in New York City and there's nothing like a cranky person at 5.30 in the morning who wants the perfect cup of coffee that you failed to deliver and being able to like um, handle that situation um, was something that I really, really learned from, from this year in my life. All right, so then I did decide to go to college and get a degree in science. And so I came um, after a two year deferral after high school, I came to Duke University for college. And this was when I first discovered what a lemur was and that there was a place called the Duke Lemur Center. And so I fell completely in passion with these animals immediately from the moment I first set foot on the DLC's campus. And so I did my work study job as um, a tour guide and then as an animal technician. And I also joined a research lab on Duke's campus when I was able Able to do my undergraduate honors thesis on olfactory signaling, so scent marking in Arsha Fox. And this was the first hint to me that I was potentially going to go down a scientific route. Um, I just was completely fascinated by these animals. But I still managed to have that nice work-life balance in college. It wasn't only lemurs. I had a nice liberal arts experience. I sang in choir. Our choir got to go on tour. So here I am in Mexico, which is a great experience. I also had a language minor. I studied German in college and I did a semester abroad in Berlin. So just because you decide to go down a science route doesn't mean that's the only thing you can study or that's the only activity you can do. And then after college, I pretty much had this idea that I wanted to be a scientist, but I didn't feel ready yet to go to graduate school. I felt like I needed time to mature, to learn more skills, that I just, I just needed like more time. And so I ended up taking a three year gap um, when I worked as an associate in research at Duke. And I worked on a project on these adorable guys near cats, and I actually spent about a year in the Kalahari Desert in South Africa collecting behavioral data and also fecal samples from these guys and studying how the pups developed and, and grew and became adult meerkats. And this project, this three year period for me was really, really critical because I was working on somebody else's scientific project. So I wasn't responsible for coming up with the science, but I was responsible for collecting a lot of the data and for producing a lot of the results. And so I got practice in some key parts of the scientific process without having to come up with the idea itself. And so this was a really important part of my training for learning key steps of the scientific process without being sort of bombarded with the whole thing um, right at the end right at the beginning. And so after this period, I felt like I was ready to go to graduate school and take that step. Um, but I really missed the lemurs. I love those meerkats, but my heart was with lemurs. And so I came back to Duke um, for graduate school um, and just decided to go lemurs full force. And in my first semester in graduate school, I was able to take my first trip um, to Madagascar, which was just an amazing eye-opening experience. Um, and that just cemented for me the idea that I wanted to go full force lemurs for pretty much the rest of my rest of my life. Um, and so this first experience in Madagascar helped me to then go back to Madagascar several more times. And I ended up marrying uh, another lemur scientist, Marina, at the Lemur Center. And so we were able to travel a lot together in Madagascar. And this was just a really like fulfilling personal and professional experience for me to spend all this time and to be able to do all these projects as part of a, a team in Madagascar. And then while I was back in the US, I still tried to maintain that commitment to work-life balance. So I stayed in choir. We actually got to go to tour to Cuba, also to Norway and Sweden as part of choir. So also if you're interested in international travel, choir is often a great way to do that. Um, I even got to sing on stage with the Rolling Stones, which was an incredible experience. 
Um, I got married while I was in graduate school and was able to take some vacation time um, to travel around Marina's home country of Argentina. So I'm, I've always tried to juggle this like work life balance, whether I was in school or acting as a professional, because I think it's really important to, to well being. And then this is me now. So I'm currently a postdoc at the Lemur Center after this like very long path. Um, so technically I'm a professional scientist, but I'm also still in training and I have a great supervisor, our director of research, um, who I can bounce all my ideas off of and we can sort of work together as a team with all the research staff at the Lemur Center and our collaborators outside of the Lemur Center to develop projects. And so I really get to now live the full scientific life that I've been through all of this training um, from writing proposals and coming up with ideas and brainstorming, which is part of my favorite part of science, to being out with the lemurs, collecting information on them, to doing the lab work, to figuring out what the results say, and then to writing up the results of our studies for publication. So it's been a long road to learn every single one of these steps that scientists need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. But now that I'm here, it's a really fulfilling and great space, um, great space to work in. And so with that, I'll say um, that I'm happy to take any questions about anything that I've talked about or things that I haven't talked about. Um, I, in summary, guess I would say that like, I love being a scientist and I love studying lemurs. Um, it's a long period of training. If you want to go down this route, you'll be in school for a very, very long time, but um, it can be a very enjoyable career and it can be very fulfilling and, and a wonderful space to be in. So yeah, I guess with that, I'm going to pop off the, the sharing. All right. All right. Awesome, Lydia. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, you know, your life as a scientist, where it's taken you, your career path, all really cool and the perfect thing to talk about uh, for the International Day for Women and Girls in Science. So thanks so much for sharing your passion with us. And you can tell it's something you're really passionate about. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I think we should meet some of our groups. Uh, anybody who's tuning in via YouTube, the chat sidebar is on the right. You can use that to send in any questions that you might have uh, for Lydia today. Uh, and I will start to grab some of our live uh, camera crew. So I'm going to start off, just going to make sure I have my list here and ready. I'm going to start off with Gavin. Gavin is joining us from Greensboro, uh, North Carolina. Uh, and it looks like he's a pretty huge lemur fan. So let me bring Gavin in here. Yes, look at that right there, lemur. Hey, Gavin, how are you? I'm good. Good. Gavin, what's, do you have a question? Oh, go what's ahead, buddy. Your favorite type of lemur? My favorite lemurs are the Shafox, and I see that you have one. Yeah, they're my they're my favorite. They were the first research project that I did by myself where I was kind of involved in coming up with the idea was on Shafox. And I just fell completely in love with them from the first moment I started studying them. And yeah, that was 14 ish years ago. And so um, I'm still totally committed to Team Shafok. I got this wing here, Lima, from the Duke Lima Center. That's great. Look at that. You have like a ring-tailed lemur and a shafak. You have like a whole little diverse ecosystem there in your room. Very cool. Gavin, thanks for sharing your lemurs with us today. Thank you. All right. There you go. That's a future lemur scientist if I've ever seen one. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. Let's go to uh, Ms. Sadler's group. They are joining us from Toronto, Ontario. So here in Canada with me. Let's bring them in live. How are we doing, Mrs. Sadler? Really well. I have a virtual class and my student Mila has a question for you. So there's a bit of a lag. Let's listen up. Go ahead, Mila. Why do scientists need to know all about lemurs? Ooh, that's a really good question. And I could talk about this forever. So I'm gonna to try to give the short version. So the question is why do scientists need to study lemurs? And I think there's a number of things we can talk about. So lemurs are incredible for a number of reasons. They're primates. So they're part of the primate family. And so there's a lot of people who study lemurs because they're related to humans. And so by studying lemurs, we can actually learn more about our own history and the path that led us to being humans. 
My personal favorite reasons for studying lemurs are not that they're primates, but actually because they're incredibly diverse. There's over a hundred different types of lemurs that live only in Madagascar. And the story of how and why they got there is just unbelievably fascinating. And unraveling that story and figuring out what went into it is just something that so many of us are really fascinated to just figure out that story of how lemurs came to be and why. And then another perspective that many scientists are interested in is conservation. Because as Joe mentioned, lemurs are some of the most endangered vertebrates on earth and they play really important roles in their ecosystem. So things like lemurs eat a lot of fruit and then they disperse the seeds in their poop and then those seeds germinate and turn into new trees. So lemurs play really important roles in pollination and seed dispersal. And if they vanish from the forest, that's gonna be really bad for the forests. So there's a lot of people that are really interested in studying lemurs to figure out how we can protect them in their natural habitat. So there's so many reasons to study lemurs um, and, and any single reason you can think of is probably a good reason. All right, great question, great answer. Um, Miss Diaz's third grade class are with us. Uh, they're not able to, well, we can try really quickly, but they weren't able to use their mic before. All right, doesn't sound like it now, but they sent us in two great questions. The first one is, uh, how many species of lemurs are there? And the second one, they were wondering, uh, do they have more than one baby at a time? So that's, those are both great questions. So we currently re recognize 108 different species of lemur that come from 15 different genera and five phylogenetic families. So that's all the sort of different levels um, of diversity that we could sort of talk about in the lemurs. But there's 108 different species, which is a lot of species all on one island. And the question about how many babies lemurs can have in one time really depends on the type of lemur that you are. So some of the small nocturnal lemurs like mouse lemurs and dwarf lemurs can have three babies in a litter, or they could have just one, or they could have twins, but they can have three at a time. And so mom has a lot of work cut out for her. Some of the bigger lemur species like the shafak will really usually only have one kiddo at a time. And then many of the lemurs that we're most familiar with, like the ring-tailed lemur um, and many of the brown lemurs, they often have twins or singletons. And then the rough lemurs are probably the most famous because mom can have really big litters of up to four or five kids, I think even more at a time. So mom really has her work cut out for her there. Um, so it really just depends on the type of lemur that you are. And pretty much every question in lemur science, if you ask me, how do lemurs do this? Or how do lemurs do that? The answer will be, it totally depends on the type of lemur that you are. All right. I'm going to bring in Mrs. Case's third grade class. I think we were having a little microphone trouble as well, but they can definitely give us a big wave for sure. Um, they are joining us. Let's can you hear us now? I hear them too from Lexington. How are we doing? We're doing great. Yeah. All right. I think we had a couple questions. All right. Go for it. How do lemurs sleep? Do they or how do they? How do they? How do, so lemurs, it's really cute because lemurs live for the most part in social groups. And so they often sleep snuggled up with their family or their group members. Some lemurs will sleep in tree holes, like dwarf lemurs snuggle up really tight in tree holes to protect themselves against predators. Other lemurs will sleep out on the branches, huddled up like a family. That's often how you'll see a shafox sleeping. And there's even some really cool examples of ring-tailed lemurs sleeping in caves um, as a way to make sure that they don't get eaten by predators. So again, different lemurs will sleep in, in, in different parts of, of their ecosystem um, as, a, as a way to protect themselves against predators, but it's so cute to see them snuggled up um, with their family members. All right, let's grab another one. Brent. Where did, how many lemurs are there? He said 108. So there's 108 different species, but a, a related question is how many individual lemurs are there in Madagascar? Is it a million? Is it 500? And the answer is scientists don't really know. Because if you think about it, how do you count every lemur in Madagascar? It'd be like trying to figure out how many squirrels live in the forests near your home. It's impossible to count every single individual. So we know how many different types of lemurs there are, and we have estimates of how many lemurs there are, but we don't know how, how many exactly there are. All right, well, we're gonna come back your way for another question or two, but I'm gonna bring in class 3-3 three, three, and I have a 50-50 shot of being right here. Is this our crew in New York? Yes, all right. Yes, I'm from New York. Perfect. 
Uh, can you, yeah, grab the unmute for us. We'd love sorry, to Sorry, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, okay, so some of our questions were, how high can lemurs jump? And um, we're assuming that's how they escape their predators. And also how old can they live until? Oh, so really good, really good questions. And again, it depends on the type of lemur that you are. So instead of talking about how high they can jump, I'm going to talk about how um, horizontal they can jump. Like the long jump is really where lemurs excel as opposed to like the high jump. And the classic example are the shafaks because they're amazing. They have really, really long, powerful back legs and they're really muscly and they're really, really strong. And they can jump about 30 feet between trees from a standstill. So they are incredibly good at the long jump and they would put the Olympians to shame that are humans. Um, and so that's just an incredible, incredible feat. And then the question about how old lemurs can live really depends on the type of lemur that you are. So the mouse lemurs um, have probably the shortest lifespan of all the lemurs. In the wild, they might live to be about eight years old under human care where they have um, excellent vet care. Like at the lemur center, they can live quite a bit older to 12 years old. Um, but some of our bigger lemurs, like our shafox or our ring-tailed lemurs, can live into their late 20s and, and even early 30s. And we have a couple of IIs that are in their late 30s um, that are enjoying enjoying their golden years. So they can live a really long time. All right, great questions from all of our groups today. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a swing through and see if we have we have time for at least a few follow-ups. So let's uh, let's start with our uh, Mrs. Sadler's group. Yes, um, Mika is wondering if lem lemurs have bones in their tails and Constanza wants to know how hard it was to really become a scientist, especially when you're when you were studying. So yes, they do have bones in their tail. And one of the things that's fun about lemurs is we often get people thinking that lemurs can hang from their tails, but they can't. So they do have bones and they do have some strength in their tail for waving it around and for wrapping themselves up with their tail, but they don't use it to hang from it. It's really more of like a balance and a communication symbol like waving. Um, and then the question about how hard it was to become a scientist. So I spent a lot of time in school and I studied really hard and I worked hard, but um, I think that could be this said for the a lot of people that work in a lot of different jobs. Um, so I think if you if you work hard and you get lucky a little bit um, and you have a good good support system around you of friends, um, it's not it's not that it's not it's really more fun than it is impossible. But yeah, there's challenges with every career and it's important that you study hard. All right, uh, Ms. Diaz's crew sent in a question via the chat. They're wondering um, who are the predators of lemurs? Oh, so everyone's interested in the predator question now. So I should first point out that at the Duke Lemur Center, we don't have predators that eat our lemurs. So this is specific to Madagascar. But in Madagascar, the major predator is something called the Pusa. Um, and it's this like really amazing sort of mongoose-like carnivore that lives only in Madagascar that can climb trees. And it's the sort of famous predator of the lemurs. Um, and it can eat the bigger lemurs as well. There are also snakes and um, birds of prey like owls and stuff that will often eat the smaller lemurs. Um, so things like mouse and dwarf lemurs are often a good snack for an owl. Um, and then I've even seen photos of some of the giant ground boas in Madagascar taking like a brown lemur or a, even a shafak up a tree and eating it. Um, so watch out for those big snakes if you're a lemur. All right, I thought I'd take just a moment here and just share my screen quick and let them get a peek. Uh, oh, great, yeah, there's the fusa. That came up, the fusa, very cool. All right, um, let's see, where should we go next? Let's check in uh, and see if Gavin has a follow-up. Gavin, do you have another question, bud? Um, no pressure. Um, how long have lemurs on the planet? Ooh, how long have lemurs been on the planet? That is a great question. So our best guess, and from genetic evidence, is that lemurs have been around for about 60 million years. 
And so we think what happened is that when the dinosaurs go extinct about 65 million years ago, um, mammals start taking off in evolutionary space and lemurs are one group of these, or primates are one group of these mammals that start really, really taking off. And so what looks like it happened because Madagascar was already an island drifting out in the ocean at this point, is that some early primate got swept out to sea on a mat of vegetation in a cyclone, a big storm, and got washed ashore by luck to Madagascar. And so when that animal stepped foot on Madagascar, it became the first lemur. And so from there, um, those ancestors of all the lemurs diversified into all these different habitats. They colonized the whole island of Madagascar and they diversified into the different species and the different foods that they eat. Um, and so they really just took off. But we think those early first lemurs were around about 50 to 60 million years ago. Okay, where do we have to go? Let's uh, check in with our third graders in Lexington. Do you guys have another question? Looks like they do. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Um, I'll How fast can they run? How fast can they run? Fast can they run? Yes. You know, I've never clocked a lemur at speed. And I actually don't know the answer to the question, but the answer is definitely that they can run faster than I can. I, I, I've never like figured out miles per hour. Um, I would actually need to look that up. So you've stumped me. All right, fair enough. And I think that's a really good point is why, you know, you need a team and lots of people is nobody can know everything about lemurs. There's some people who just study their hand and how it works or how they use their space or uh, how they feed. So yeah, you can't know everything about every lemur, especially when there's over 100 species. And I will say that it's also really important as a scientist to be comfortable saying you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big part of being a scientist is, is just saying that you know a lot about a very small amount of information. And most of the information out there in the world, I have no idea about. All right. And let's bring in New York one more time. Hi. Okay. Um, so we have a question about were, how did the lemurs respond to you when you first started studying? Were they afraid of you as a human? And also, how are they with water? Can they swim? How do they handle being in the water? Great. Those are great questions. So at the Duke Lemur Center here, our animals are really well, what we call habituated to people. They've spent their lives around people. They trust us. They're not scared of us. And they go about their normal routine, even if people are around. So when I first started working with the lemurs, they might have like looked at me and been like, okay, cool, you're hanging out with us. Um, but as long as I keep my respectful distance and I just collect information on what they're doing, they have no problem with me being there and they never have had a problem with me being there. Now, lemurs in Madagascar sometimes are a little different because many wild lemurs are not habituated to people. They're not used to having people around and they get very scared um, and they often try to flee. And so a lot of scientists working in Madagascar work on populations that have been studied for decades by many scientists. So those animals are really used to people. And if you're going to work on a new population that's never been studied, you usually need to plan a couple of years to spend um, getting the animals used to you being around. So this process of habituation is really important if you're going to be doing behavioral observation. And I already forgot the second question. Can you repeat it? I'm sorry. Can they swim? Sorry. How do they respond to water? Oh, sorry. Yeah, great, great. Sorry about that. I'm like blanking. Um, so lemurs definitely drink water, um, but they are not swimmers. I think I have heard a couple of anecdotal reports of a few lemurs that have taken a swim, but it is not a common, a current thing that we see with lemurs. Um, so yeah, they, they like to drink it, but not necessarily to hang out in it. Okay. Well, uh, as we're wrapping up, uh, there is kind of a fun question in the chat. Clearly, some of the students have watched uh, Madagascar before, and they're wondering, can lemurs really dance? Um, no, not really. I mean, if you like play party music to them, they probably wouldn't respond. Um, they are like very agile and they're very graceful in the trees. Um, and they do like a lot of fun, different types of movements that I think people have often like put to music on videos and stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, most of their locomotion movement has to do with getting around or with communicating with one another and much less with dancing. But All it's right. fun to imagine. All right, I'm gonna squeeze one more question in here. 
Uh, our Toronto class slipped another question in the chat. Meerkats and lemurs, you've studied both. Do you find them similar? Yes and no. So they are similarly fascinating. Um, and they're also both social, which um, was part of the reason I was interested in both. So meerkats live in these big, big, big social groups about the same size as ring-tailed lemurs. And they have a very structured social system. So you have like a dominant female and a dominant male. And then you have a bunch of offspring um, that live with them that also help rear new kids. So there's this really, really dynamic social structure that goes on with them that's um, in many ways similar to things that we see with ring-tailed lemurs. And the other thing that's um, in parallel is this idea of female dominance. So in most lemurs and in meerkats, it's the females that are in charge of making decisions in the social group. And they get priority of access to food. They get to beat up the males if the males aren't behaving properly. Um, and so it was this idea of female dominance um, was part of the reason the lab that I was in was studying both meerkats and lemurs. And that's a great topic for, for today and when we're celebrating women and girls in science. Okay, well, a huge shout out to our classrooms who joined us live in camera spots today. Such great questions. Uh, a huge here, I actually see them waving. Let me bring a couple of them in just so they can give a little, a little wave here. There's some of our crew hanging out with us today. Um, a big shout out to those on YouTube who are tuning in. Thanks for joining us today. And Lydia, thanks for joining us and sharing your story on such an important day. Thanks for having me, it's been fun. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. We're signing off for today. Don't forget, we have a ton of live classroom events tomorrow, 15 to choose from, uh, with great women scientists, explorers, and conservationists from all uh, over the world. So thanks again, everyone, and we're signing off.